So yeah. let me let me real quick, I'll just give people a little, anybody listening, I'll just give a brief introduction and you're welcome to add anything you like to this. So okay. uh, Bill Timoney is an actor, director, you're a, a, an acting coach, you're a script consultant, you write, you, you do screenwriting yourself, you cast and coordinate and deliver ADR sessions for films, you're uh, one of Brian Cranston's, perhaps his, his most prized collaborative partner, uh, and you might know more film industry trivia than anybody walking this earth, though I will say there's nothing, there's nothing trivial about your, your knowledge. Um, Very nice. I feel like I could start an interview with almost anything from any place and we'd end up somewhere interesting, but uh, um, I'll, I'll do my best to keep us on some, you know, train tracks that we can relate to however loosely. Okay. Um, so uh, what, what are you involved in right now? What are you, what are you most uh, directly involved with at the moment? Well, it, it's an odd thing that we're doing this on this day because I do have something that uh, has really fired me up. Uh, it has to do with a potential project that I pitched to someone who, let me say, is a, um, a household name. Mm -hmm. And no, it's not Brian. Um, <laughs> and we're it's in not me. And it's not you. Not you. Uh, so, uh, and that's all I can say. I'm sorry to bring it up, but, but oh, you, know, you say, what is, I mean, that's, that's what's, you know, like I had the dogs out in the woods this morning. That's that's what's making all the wheels turn in my head. Um, and hopefully by this time next week, uh, we should have some forward uh, motion on it. Otherwise, uh, the thing I've been doing the last couple of weeks is I adapt scripts for foreign language media companies. Um, you know, they give me the rough translation and they give me the, uh, the, the footage, if it's a movie or video. Um, and I, or, you know, an animated project. And I adapt the scripts to, to, to do, there's two things I need to do. One is they call it fit the flap. You know, you're in a movie and you're speaking a language and your mouth moves five times. And yet the sentence, the cue you're saying is 25 syllables. Mm. Well, I gotta make those 25 syllables fit in the five flaps. And I'm not just going to, you know, talk fast or tell the actor to talk fast. Yeah. And I also wanna, I also wanna adapt it for uh, American viewers. So if it's a, almost an archaic translation into English, I want to make it more colloquial. Um, and that's, that's what I've been doing right, right now. I have a, a recurring client from China. Uh, I've had clients from a long, long running client from Turkey, um, South Korea. I mean, I, I get this stuff from all over the place. And it's, for an actor, it's a good, like bartender gig. It's a good uh, side yeah. <laughs> between acting. And it, it has... You know, anytime you can go into an acting audition without needing the job, that only empowers you in the room during the audition. And when yeah. you're down to your last dime, you're dead, D-E-D, -E -D, dead. You might as well not even go into the audition. So having a side gig that, uh, you know, at, at my age, you know, I'm past bartending, I'm past waiting on tables. <laughs> in my 20s, I Never was, say never. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> um, but I was I was a graveyard shift paralegal and proofreader at one of those you know twenty four hour law firms in Midtown. Mm. Whereas now, I get up when I want. I go into the next room. I open my laptop. I download the video. I download the uh, the uh, translation, and I start working. And I work at my pace. And I work in my home. I can let the dogs out. I can feed the cats. You know, so I like that. It's it's very creative. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If, if nothing else, it's a really convenient side gig for an actor. Absolutely. So that is uh, so. Just to, to clarify, you're not you're not adapting the script itself off the page. You're working with what's already on the screen, and you're and you're adapting like through almost like through an ADR session, like having people, you know. Uh, well, no, that that'll happen once I turn in my adaptation and the client approves it. Then it goes to the ADR stage, and actors re record it. Um, and okay. I do most of the scripts I adapt with my clients. They also know I'm a voice actor. So I invariably end up getting cast in uh -huh. what I'm And the other thing is, you know, when you work at that level of stuff, you know, the scale, the hourly rate stuff, um, like I did a ton of anime dubbing when the anime import craze happened in the early 2000s. 
you know, you have to work very fast. It's one thing to be very good at it and give a full performance. But if you can do 20 to 30 cues in an hour, you're not going to last. If you could do 40, 45 cues in an hour, which is working very fast, but then, I mean, there's a difference between the client paying you three hours for the day or four hours for the day. Um, and the clients, they do keep track of who not only works well, but more importantly, sometimes. Works uh -huh. And, and knowing, the, knowing the script rather than looking cold at it, which is how you record. When, when you do dubbing of a foreign language pro project uh, or you go in for a looping session to do group, you never get a script in advance. You're seeing the script seconds before the third, the three beeps go and you have to record. So mm. you have to be able to read quick and to make really strong choices immediately, which of course always gets back to take improv, all you youngins, take improv classes because it helps you make strong choices immediately without hesitation. And to have so, that, but, that freedom. But if, the, but, if, but if I'm the guy who's adapted the script, yeah. I know what's coming, I know who's who, I know who likes who, who's trying to kill who, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I can work even faster uh, because I adapted a script myself. Mm -hmm. And then how, how involved are you in after the fact then like in process of casting people and getting people lined up that either that well, you know or that you've vetted or? Well, when, when I did it, when I did anime uh, back in, I guess we started in the 1990s and then that went into the 2000s. Um, I actually uh, did a lot of talent coordinating. Um, I was working at a house that, uh, post-production house where I, I adapted the scripts. Uh, I cast the talent. Um, I cast myself and I would also, um, I would also direct the, the recording sessions. Mm. So I was very involved. I did a whole bunch of anime titles that way. Um, but that was sort of an exception because I was the in-house guy doing a lot of that. Uh, generally speaking with this other stuff, you know, I worked with this Turkish client for years. Um, unfortunately, uh, all the heads of their company were thrown in jail um, by uh, the ruler over there, Erdogan. He shut down the network. It's called the Samanyolo network. Uh -huh. and he accused them all of being Gulenists and that Gulenists were behind an attempted coup and um, they all got imprisoned. Oh my God. The Salmonyolo network was shut down. But I was, you know, in those, you know, saying about maybe 10 years ago, six years ago, they were bringing all their television shows and they had just like American shows. Um, there was their version of Highway to Heaven. There was their version of Law and Order. You know, there mm -hmm. were all these different kinds of programs. I mean, they yeah. were not because they weren't paying rights, but it was sort of like that. Um, and they were, they wanted them dubbed in English and put up on their website. So American audiences could could watch them, and I did a ton of their shows. Uh, and again, it was it was a good gig until uh, until they got imprisoned. Until the turf, yeah, wow, wow, yeah. Which, by the way, the Gulenists were not behind the. <laughs> I, I I gleaned that much. Yes, wow, wow. Um, well, there's a few. There's a number of things you touched on that I would, if we had more time, I would probably like loop back and want to touch on a number of things you've, you've mentioned, even going back to the stuff about working as a paralegal, like the, the 24 hour law firm, but I'll, I'll take us back a little bit to start with. So um, I don't know if we've ever, I feel like this probably come up and this will probably ring a bell when you answer it. What was the first thing that really lit your fuse artistically? Like what was the first thing that really hooked you, whether it was a film you watched as, you know, as a kid or what made you feel like this is something you had to be involved with? Well, you know, I had a, a thriving television career uh, from which I retired in order to attend kindergarten. Um, I, I knew a part of this. Well, I, I heard of, I heard a, uh, one version of the story. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was I was a baby. I mean, the, the first commercial I appear in is 1958. That was you know, getting your education is important, Bill. Uh, but yeah, I don't and I have no memory of, of, of any of that. I have no memory at all. Um, and I was, I was a very, I was the smallest kid in my class. I was very small and tiny and lo young looking for my age. Uh, and I had a bad stutter. So I rarely spoke up, rarely spoke up. That I did not know. But I do remember getting a laugh, like getting a laugh around the house. And my dad had a great laugh. My mom has, has a great laugh. I do remember getting a laugh at, at school. And I was never a class clown because I was too, you know, uh, withdrawn for that. Um, I love sports. I was, I like to think I was the best street hockey goalie in my town at that time. 
um, loved baseball, but I was so small. I was fast, but I was so small. I kept getting my skull cracked open. Um, and so I, I retreated into movies. I loved seeking out movies. Um, as a little boy, it was the monster movies. Boris Karloff was my hero. And then got a little older and start, the Hammer film started coming and I got to see Peter Cushing. Especially, I saw a couple of Peter Cushings in the theater. So, um, and this is before Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I'm the only person who went to see the original Star Wars in what was that, 1975? Um, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. I want to say 79 maybe. Oh no, it was, it was earlier than that. Um, 77 is maybe ringing a bell? Star Wars. 77, you might be right with that. But I was, I was the only guy who went because it was the new Peter Cushing movie. I knew nothing about anybody else except Alec Guinness, of course. But no, who Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, what is it? You know, it, it meant nothing yeah. to anybody except I had to go the first day because it's Peter Cushing's newest film. Um, and then right when I was an adolescent and puberty was hitting, I came across the Sean Connery, James Bonds. And I saw every one of those movies in the theater because United Artists on off, when there wasn't a Bond film coming out, they would reissue the Bonds on double bills. So it was watching the Bond films that really got me thinking about cinema. Uh, mm. Because that's where you could find, you know, attractive young women in their underwear. But, yeah, yeah. but just as important was the creativity behind it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I can, I can remember. Were you, did you read the books or anything? Was was there any hook there from the books? Or you I just did. I lived. I lived in a town across from uh, the George Washington Bridge called the River called River Edge, mm -hmm. right Hackensack and Paramus, and we had a library, and I spent every waking moment in that library and uh yeah they did have a collection of uh of fleming uh so i did because i'd seen the movie and again the immediate gratification of our culture now of our society now you know if i saw a movie on the cbs friday night movies i had to wait at least a year before i could see it again hmm. you know pre-internet pre-video stores video stores are extinct i remember when video stores became a bit i mean i can just go down the street and get a copy of goldfinger and watch it right now yeah that was mind-blowing uh so i was just i was insatiable about finding film getting movies and getting access to them this is even before people magazine and entertainment weekly movies movie weekend grosses weren't reported in the newspaper you know so if you were a cinemaniac like me, you really had to go crazy to get your fix. And, mm -hmm. my, and my folks gave me a Super 8 camera for my birthday when I was 11, I think. And all in the backyard, down the woods with the guys, we're making army movies, we're making werewolf movies, you know, we're making stupid, silly comedies, we're all <laughs> idiots. You know, I'd, I just kept making short films and being in the basement, cutting my short films together watching the short films in between waiting for the next creature features on Saturday night. I, I was just, a, I was just intensely focused on watching movies, finding movies, making movies and learning everything I could about movies, which is your reference point to trivia. Uh, I, I can't stop reading about how did that get made? What was the decision behind casting that person instead of that person? Why did this movie end this way instead of moving an, a, another way? You know, I'm just, even to this day, and I'm 63, I'm insatiable about finding out, you know, some guys in, in, uh, in high school, they want to know how a car works. So they're always taking it apart and putting back the engine. Uh, for me, that was film. Mm -hmm. What, when you first started doing that and like, you know, running out in the backyard and into the woods making movies, was there a particular aspect of it that was most intriguing to you as far as being in front of the camera, wanting to direct the shots, wanting to figure out lighting? And that, was there anything in particular or the editing process? I mean, what was there something about it that was sort of at the top of the list of like, that's the thing that really gets me? Thanks to this question you've asked, I just realized it. It was the response of the viewer. Hmm. I did everything I did with movies because I wanted to hear how the people who were watching it reacted. I had hmm. a projector and a screen set up in the basement. We'd invite people over, mom and dad would come down the stairs, other neighbors or whatever, and 
watching them react and me looking at them a moment before to see how they were going to react. That's that's why I did. And you know the punchlines coming up, or you know the the jump like, scares coming up. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. Back in about 2006, 2007, I was the um, the curator of something called the monthly short film form that the Black Box of Asbury Park presented in the Stephen Crane House. And it was, I forget what day of the week it was, once a month. And I would put together an extremely eclectic and bizarre menagerie of short films that we would screen uh, for the locals. And it had- oh, so, I'm sorry, this was, this was when? Say that one more time? Probably, probably 2007. Um, okay, okay. It was, it was in Asbury Park. Um, and, and I wanted to challenge. I mean, they wanted this. This was, and it was, it was you know, you, you contributed at the door, but there was no ticket to buy. And I love programming, uh, pro, uh, scheduling programs and all that. And I would have like a silly cartoon followed by an intensely serious live action film. I, I once showed a film <laughs> at our film festival about a Palestinian man and his little boy trying to get through an Israeli checkpoint. And the little boy is being silly and is saying things he shouldn't be saying. And the tension, it's one of the most intense movies I ever watched. And it's just a little kid not, oh. not being quiet. You know, not that there was anything to hide, but the man knows what the, what the stakes are and the little boy doesn't. And I followed it with a Laurel and Hardy short. You know, I would do that kind of thing. Mm. In that particular screening time, um, you mentioned Brian Cranston. He was... He was over at the time because we were doing a play, the, the four character Neil Simon play chapter two, Brian and myself and our wives who are both actors. And on this one night, uh, Brian's wife and their daughter came to the black box to see my screening. So when we were, when I had the Laurel and Hardy playing, it was the music box, which is the very first short film to ever win the best, uh, the Oscar for best live action short. And I hope you know the music box. I'm sorry, I don't. Laurel and Hardy pushing a piano up a flight of stairs. Yeah, the, the image of that rings a bell. I don't, I don't know that I... It is one yeah. of the great comedies of all time. Okay, okay, it's, it's on my of, list. If you're a student of comedy, you have to watch Laurel and Hardy's The Music Box. Okay. And Laurel and Hardy, one of the great things about them is that they go the opposite way of hitting you with jokes. In fact, they, they try to see how far they can go without getting a laugh before they give you a laugh. There's almost a suspense aspect to mm -hmm. Laurel's work. And that's Stan Laurel's genius. He, he wrote all their work. And what the climax of the music box is my all-time favorites. And I worked my way into the room so I could see uh, Brian's wife, Robin, and their daughter, Taylor, I could see their faces for like the minute leading up to the climax as they're watching and watching and watching. And then what happens happens and the look on their faces as they exploded in laughter. When I sometimes feel the need to get buoyant because I'm getting down, I might just access that visual memory of the two of them going down in laughter to Laurel and <laughs> music box. And that gets uh. me. So yeah, I think it's more, yeah, I love the editing. I love the, I love the, the, the lighting. I love the, the writing. I love the direction. You know, the, the short films I did, I always worked the camera. I don't think I'm in anything I ever shot when I was a kid. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just obsessed with it. And it was that, that all, about, from the audience. It was all about getting the response, entertaining people, making people laugh. Laughter is Getting somebody to laugh. That's a wonderful thing. That it is. That's making me think I, I, uh, it's making me think of a great, well, it's, yeah, kind of similar kind of story from uh, from Bradley Cooper talking about when he was, you know, like 11, 12, 13 or something, and his dad sitting him down and watching all sorts of, you know, like movies that were way beyond, you know, a 12 or 13 year olds, you know, whatever, watching, you know, everything from the Godfather movies to like Apocalypse Now to, uh, but he said it was the Elephant Man that really was the one that sort of like clicked something for him and watching it and and his first thought being something to the effect of being enamored with what Anthony Hopkins was doing, but then, a f you know, some years down the road realizing, no, it wasn't really what Hopkins was doing so much as it was what Lynch was doing behind the camera as far as setting these shots up and, and, yeah. and him having this observation of his own response and, 
and and realizing, well, you know, yeah, I'm doing this acting thing, but really, you know, him are articulating the idea that down the line, what he really wants to do is be a director because realizing that it was really what Lynch was doing that really hooked him in some kind of way because of his own response in the moment. Um, as as consumers, the public has to suspend their disbelief. They have hmm. to believe that Mel Gibson is firing that weapon and that he's doing the, and Daniel Craig is doing that jump without all the wires that ended up getting hmm. erased later. You know, you have to suspend your disbelief, but, but yeah, but the enormous team involved behind creating a, a piece of entertainment um, goes far, far beyond who we're looking at. You know, you know, I think we've talked about this. This goes back to the Bond films. I'm a big uh, fan of voice acting. I love voice acting, but I knew about it because when I was 11, I went to a double bill Saturday matinee of my first Bond films, Thunderball and You Only Live Twice. And there are actors in both those films who have the same voice, even though it's different people I'm looking at. I mean, the villain in Thunderball has the same voice as the uh, as the Japanese uh, uh, secret agent head, and and the the and the second girl who Bond marries and lives twice has the same voice as the heroine in Thunderball, hmm. and on and on and on. Because I saw them back to back as an eleven year old, I started to figure out what revoicing was, and that's what motivated me. And it took me thirty years before I got into. Uh, the business of ADR myself. Hmm. How, uh, well, my next question was going to be sort of adjacently related. How do you feel about the new Bond films compared? Or, or how do you feel about the trajectory and the evolution of Bond films? I was, um, all right, so I, I'm too- and should And should either you or Brian play the next James Bond? Um, an American should never play Bond. There. We got plenty of that. Um, the history of the Bond cinema is one of my things, but at some point you and I both are going to have to turn off the lights and go to sleep. So don't get me too far down that road. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I thought Daniel Craig, uh, just knowing his um, work in Road to Perdition and what was the other one? Lemon Cake? It was Lemon Cake, right? I don't know Lemon Cake. I know, I know Road to Perdition. Cake. Is it layer cake or lemon cake? But that's the film that Barbara, that's the film that Barbara Broccoli saw and said that's the next James Bond, mm. uh, and that's true. Um, he's terrific in that. He's opposite. Is it? I guess he's opposite against Michael Gambon. Um, so I thought he was a great choice. Uh, I remember seeing the commercials for Honor Majesty's Secret Service. So that's where I am but I didn't go, I wasn't old enough to go. But the next year was the double bill of Thunderball and you only have twice. So I saw that. And then all the other reissues, they, I saw Goldfinger with From Rush With Love and I saw Dr. No with From Rush With Love. You know, so I got all caught up in the theater. And so I'm a Connery nut, I'm a Bond fan. And then the Roger Moore thing I was very cool with, but I broke my streak. I did not go to theater to see the last one, View to a Kill because he just should not have done it. Um, and, his, uh... and I broke my streak again with the Spectre. Mm. Um, so those are the three I have not seen in the big screen, on the big screen. I think, I think Skyfall is an extraordinary film. Um, I'm so disappointed that Albert Finney played Angus instead of Connery, which I think was the intention. Mm. Uh, when when they first started working on it, that was the intention. You know, Fleming Fleming was was very much against Connery's casting because he was a rough Scot and not a refined Englishman. I, I remember reading that, yeah, that, they, that he felt he was, yeah, too, I think the phrase I remember was, yeah, too rough around the edges. But you couldn't argue with the success to the point where when he then wrote Under Majesty's Secret Service, he put a Scottish lineage in Bond's background to make sense of Connery. Of course, by the time they go to make the film- well, Fleming Connery, did. So Fleming like- Fleming, yeah. Reverse so, engineered his own world. Right, but because I hadn't really explained it. I mean, they knew, you knew Bond was an orphan, but it's not until on Her Majesty's Secret Service do you learn that he was raised by, you know, um, adopted uh, parents who adopted him in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So that whole, that whole third act of Skyfall comes out of Honor Her Majesty's Secret Service 
his 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 you know other families yeah. uh, back so when he sees old angus you know i can't believe you're still alive and that kind of stuff that stuff that doesn't necessarily appear in the book magic secret service but that's where it comes from because fleming put it in there to make sense of connery's scottish accent hmm. uh i think craig well, is i'm gonna have to go back and revisit skyfall with that in mind i i could not it would have been great if connery had played it um but i could not bear specter because i went what blofeld and bond or what that how are they connected and i went wait a minute that's that's the background of Austin Powers Three Gold Member. <laughs> is that Doctor Evil? And I said, I said, how the hell? Where do you come off trying to trying to shoehorn that thing in? It was already done for comic effect over a dozen years ago. We're all paying attention. We're but pulling. We're pulling from the wrong universes here. I love the idea of Christoph Waltz as as Blofeld. But this, you know, we we actually grew up together, and Daddy loved you best, or something. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. I I was so so deeply disappointed at that just that one plot device because i love ray fines uh, every was that yeah. naomi harris playing money penny she's so awesome i remember from 28 days later um i just andrew scott you know, yeah yeah but but trying to pull that thing off i was like I, I just didn't know what they were smoking I'm, i mean something, I'm, something I'm, real I'm, good i'm glad they found their way into specter uh-huh you know, we're able to get all the rights back and make it all happen together. You do know that Ian Fleming's a bad guy and a thief, right? I, d I don't know this. What What's the story there? Thunderball. All right. How much time? Do we, have? we have three hours. Okay, good. Here we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, once it, once the books are doing well, mm. he wants he wants camera, camera, camera. He wants to get movies made, and uh, uh, he sells Casino Royale's rights to somebody who then puts it on a, a one hour adapted um, thing, Climax Theater on CBS. Um, he, oh, do you know Miracle on 34th Street? Yeah. Miracle on 34th Street, right? Mm -hmm. a, a handsome lawyer, Mr. Gailey, mm -hmm. uh, who's defending uh, Chris Kringle. That's John Payne. John Payne was a very good light comic actor and was a, was a matinee idol. And in the 50s, he tried to harden his image and he made a bunch of like tough guy movies. And, he's, and they're very good. They're low budget. Uh, no gave himself art. an edge. He's very plain. Payne gave himself a good edge. Did you know that he was almost James Bond? Really? He bought Moonraker. And he was going to develop a film version of Moonraker. But he uh, was, was he even, he's, he's, uh, yeah, he's an American guy though. Yeah. That's right. But Fleming wanted, wanted to get on camera. So uh, huh. Payne bought the rights or an option on Moonraker. And as he got deeper into it, he went, why am I doing this? I'm reading all the books. I want to do all these. So he tried to get an option on all the existing books from Fleming, the character. And Fleming went, well, why don't you make a movie out of Moonraker first and then we'll see. Yeah. They went back and forth. Neither one would budge. And the option ran out and Payne didn't renew the option. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment there where John Payne was almost the first film James Bond. Wow. Um, so Fleming is keep trying to find a pitch to CBS. They're going to do this show. I think it's called C Commander Jamaica or something. Um, and then he meets socially through mutual friends, uh, a guy named Kevin McClory. He's one of the more fascinating guys you'll, you'll meet. As a teenager, he was in the British Navy in, in World War II and his ship sank. And he survived for 17 days on driftwood out in the North Sea, which convinced people that he knew how to handle water. So John Huston hired him to do uh, assistant director work on the African Queen, just because he knew he could leave this guy out there in, in the middle of nowhere on water and he could handle it. Uh, uh, around the world in 80 days, same thing, all those water scenes, that's Kevin McClory. Kevin McClory. What, what do you mean point. that's him? Just that he was pr like principally involved in coordinating how they were going to set those things up? Or? Yeah, he'd be like, yeah, you know, because you need the crew to get out there. There's the boat we're shooting on a lake and, you know, and, and this is how you know, it's going to work. And they all go, well, if, if Kevin has been out on the water for he's, 70 days, yeah. what am I complaining about? He's tried and true. And and, yeah. and, and he was a colorful Irishman. So Houston liked him. And uh, mm -hmm. Michael Todd, who, who was the mastermind behind Around the World in 80 Days, liked him. Uh, a lot of people like Kevin McClure, and He's a smart guy. And uh, Huntington Hartford and Ivar Bryce, uh, Hartford was is the heir to A&P. He's got this place in 
Bahamas, Bahamas, right? Thunderball, Bahamas. Well, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, um, what, what was the first Daniel Craig? Uh, Casino Royale. Casino Royale. The Bahamas um, nightclub stuff. The 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 uh, where they casino, actually mm -hmm. with the with the, with the, all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. filmed. That's filmed in the same place where they filmed those same scenes in Thunderball. Oh, really? Okay. They're the exact same. And there's an attractive older woman sitting there during that first card game when Bond wins the Aston Martin. Yeah. She's the woman who he dances with in Thunderball when they're trying mm. to on the dance floor. You should have told me your wife was here. That's Diane. I wonder, I wonder how many people catch that little little Easter egg. Okay. That's Diane Hartford, who is married to Huntington Hartford. And that's basically where they live. So that's where they went back. They did all these callbacks. There's an Asian woman sitting in Casino Royale in the climactic Texas Hold'em. Yeah. That's, I uh, uh, can't, I think it's Tina Chen, Tina Chen, who is the woman in bed with Connery in You Only Live Twice, <laughs> when, when, when he gets the fake assassination. Yeah, yeah. Why do Chinese women taste different? You think we taste better, huh? No, it does it's like It's like Peking duck tastes different from Beef Wellington. Darling, I give you very best duck. And then the Murphy bed goes up and they're there. That's, so she was in You Only Live Twice and now she's in Christine Royale. So is Diane Hartford. You, yes, you, see, yes. you see how deep I go in this shit? I do, I do. Anyway, anyway. All right, so this, this one, anyway, we'll, we'll keep this. Go so ahead. I'll wrap this up. Hartford yeah, yeah. invites Fleming and McClory and a writing partner of his, um, Jack Whittingham, to go hang out for a month in the, Bahama, in, in the Bahamas to work out this story they're going to do called Warhead. And McClory and Whittingham say to Fleming, the problem you have, Ian, with your Bond books is the villains are very pedestrian. And their crimes are very pedestrian. I'm cheating at cards. You need big villains, like a, an international crime syndicate and really mysterious stuff. People trying to take over galaxies. So McClory and Whittingham invent Spectre. And the head of Spectre, number one. And it's, and it's Fleming who names number one after a boyhood friend of his, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. That's a real guy, a real name. Wow. But the creation of Spectre and all that stuff, what it stands for, that belongs to McClory. And then a movie McClory has made called Boy on the Bridge comes out and bombs, which makes Fleming think, oh, this guy doesn't know he's talking about anyway. And he cancels everything and they walk away from the deal. Except Fleming goes ahead and includes Spectre and everything that he didn't, he didn't own in his new novel, Thunderball. Mm -hmm. And when the movie comes out, McClory sues and that's how this whole thing starts. Mm -hmm. Fleming did not create Spectre and, and that whole thing that's the work of McClory and, uh, and Whittingham, but Fleming stole it. There you have it. Wow. And claimed and claimed credit for it, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, last, last Bond question. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite pick for the next Bond? Not at all. The, the, pe the people I see listed as candidates being like Tom Hardy, Idris Elba. Um, I, saw, I saw people even talking about like Tom Hiddleston and Cillian Murphy and uh, I'm trying to remember who else, but any 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 young agile Brits that really stand out in your mind? I and, well, I think you said you said the right word, uh, uh, young. Um, you may not know that there was an actor who signed to play, who agreed to play James Bond when Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman started their their uh, franchise, and that is the man who was the best man at Cubby's wedding. Cary Grant. Huh. Cary, Cary Grant and Cubby were pals. And as Cubby and Harry started brainstorming which film we're going to do first, or well, let's do Thunderball. It just came out. And Fleming went, um, we might have some trouble with Thunderball. Why don't you do Dr. No first? They're okay, we'll do Dr. No. They said, we want our Bond films to follow the template of, of Hitchcock's North by Northwest. And when you look closely at them, they do. North by Northwest is the template for the Bond films. Mm. And they said, well, then let's get Hitchcock to direct. He said, no, thank you. He likes to develop his own stories. And then, and then they said, well, you know, Cary, why don't you ask him? And sure enough, Broccoli offered the James Bond role to Cary Grant. Cary Grant accepted it. And they were talking about it and they were putting together the whole plan. 
And Cubby went back to Carrie to talk about the five films. And Carrie said, wait a minute, what do you mean five films? I'm doing just Dr. No. They said, no, Carrie, it's going to be a five picture contract. He said, no, it's not. So that's when Cary Grant walked away. And that's what made them say, you know what? We should always use unknowns because we don't want a star that's bigger than the franchise. Yeah. So as great as Idris Elba would be and so many other names you just mentioned, I think you've got it. Because to the American market, Daniel Craig was a complete unknown. He was, yeah, he was to me. It's like when I saw him, I, I, I vaguely went, oh, where have I seen him? Oh, Road to Perdition. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know him from Adam, you know? And that's, what's, that's what the next James Bond is going to be. He's going to be somebody who uh, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson can mold into the franchise as opposed to, like, there was a time uh, United Artists wanted Burt Reynolds to be uh, Bond. And at the time, <laughs> you imagine that? And at the oh. time they wanted uh, Mel Gibson as Bond. That's funny. God, probably that's funny. a little more, but that's the star is bigger than the franchise. And and that that's a rule that uh, Rockley's kids will never break. Yeah. All right. I'm going to I'm going to redirect us now. Um, was there a point uh, for you when when you either made a conscious decision to move? Not away from acting, because obviously you're still acting, you're still actively working as an actor. Um, but there was was there a time when you sort of made a conscious decision to kind of move into the realm of coaching and consulting and things, or was that just something that sort of ended up developing well, organically? I'll give you two answers. Yeah. Uh, uh, my first career started in the early 80s and ended in the mid late 80s. Um, I was on a soap opera. I was doing stand up. I was in my mid 20s. You know, the I, didn't, I didn't know you did stand up. Wow, that's oh, yeah. Yeah, I um, and it, in fact it was Cranston. Cranston did it. Um, we were taking an improv comedy class together when we first became friends. And he said, let's go at the improv. And we'd watch the improv where, you know, ironically enough, it's not improv, it's stand up. Yeah. And he said, you should go to the, op you, should, you should audition, you should audition. And it, it was one Sunday a month. You'd all walk in, the door would close. You'd all put your hand into the champagne bucket and pull out a piece of paper. Most of them would be blank, but if one had a number on it, that was your number to go on that night in that order. And I got a number. Brian and I went around the corner, spent a couple hours writing my, my routine <laughs> and went on that night. And the owner, Silver Friedman, said, you're, not, you're called back. You come back next month. I went back next month. I killed. I came off stage. She said, okay, you're now a regular here. You're a regular roster member. So for about two years there, I was doing a lot of stand-up at the improv. Then I went out and uh, I tried to extend my career in LA. Uh, I was stunned to find that they do not hand out sitcoms right by the baggage pickup at LA. <laughs> and, after, and after about a year and a half, I came back east with my tail between my legs. And I spent about six years bartending, waiting on tables, third shift paralegal, uh, you know, proofreader. And just to back up, this was, this was, you had already been on Loving? No, no, I was on oh. all my children. Brian was on Loving. Got it. Yeah, they, oh, got they, it, got they, it, got it, got it. For some reason, I thought you guys were together on, uh, no, he, he had a lead role on a show nobody watched, and I mm. had a supporting role on a show everybody watched. Everybody, yeah, okay. Uh, and so this was, this, was at, this was during, after, before getting uh, all my children? Uh, well, I, I got to see, I was on all my children in 82, 83, 84, and then my storyline really, really died down in 85. Okay. And somebody told me that there was a conversation in the hair and makeup room one day and people were, were debating who on the show should go to LA. You know, try your hand at the pilot season, which pilot season was a thing back then. And apparently it was Susan Lucci, who of course was not only the star of our show, but you know, the number one star at daytime, Erica. Mm. She said, well, the only member of this cast who should go to LA is Billy Timoney because we're all doing melodrama, but Billy's really doing sitcom technique and they, sh and they make sitcoms in LA. And somebody shared that information with me and you know she was right and i i tried it but i did not succeed and then when i came back for the next six years i did survival jobs and in my 30s i swore any survival job i'm going to have that's not acting is going to be connected to the business and it was then that i got into voice acting and i, I did some casting i was i did stage combat choreography for university productions of shakespeare mm. um, I, I've, done, I've done all kinds of things to stay involved in the industry, make relationships, learn about different aspects of, of how we make product. But in terms of the coaching thing, 
that was two people. Uh, Peter Pamela Rose, who's a, who's a coach, who I do a lot of uh, looping with. I actually brought her into the looping business industry. And, uh, and Cranston. He said, you know, you're always helping our friends with their auditions. And you're always, he said, I've seen you call people when there's an audition you know about that they're right for. I once got Brian's wife a job out of nowhere. I was reading for a film and I said, who's the female lead? And they said, oh, well, and the casting directors I, and I got along. They said, well, we haven't found somebody yet. And I had a copy of the movie Brian had directed, Last Chance, which stars his wife. Yeah. I had the video of it in my bag. And I handed it to her. I said, this is Robin Dearden. She should play. It was a movie that starred Peter Fonda and Chris Christopherson and Keith Carradine. Mm. And Robin's character was to play Peter Fonda's daughter. The show was called Wooly Boys. And I, I, I just pitched her right there. And I got a call from her that afternoon going, what did you do? I now have this. You know. <laughs> and, when, and when she got it, when she got it, she said, you have to be available to me every morning when I get up in Montana so we can go over the scripts of what I'm shooting that day. She said, and what I will do is, she said, you've never been to Big Sur? I'm going to send you on a vacation to Big Sur. And it was right after that that I got married and I cashed in that Big Sur trip as our honeymoon. Oh my God, that's so, great. I tell people barter is always a wonderful thing in this business. So, but Brian said, you're always helping other people. He said, monetize this, make this a business. There's a, there's a demand out there. It's not just your friends. There are a lot of people out there who could use what you do, you know, help them find the insight, help them find the inspiration. So hang out your shingle. So that's why I'm on coaching is because I want to shut Cranston up. <laughs> Perfect. A life, a lifelong uh, endeavor, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, what, and and, and uh, kind of tagged onto that question, what do you find at this point most, most inspiring, most in, meaningful, satisfying about that work, as opposed to, say, 5, 10, 20 years ago? Like, how has that evolved in terms of what aspect of that you really get off on the most? This business. Let me use a, a, an analogy from the natural world. There's a wonderful cave down in Mexico and at dusk, bats by the millions come swarming out to feed on the insects. But there are some snakes who have learned that if they hang on to a tree branch at the back of their body, they can get a good five, six feet over the cliff and just snatch whatever bat they can. This business, the entertainment business, film, television, stage, is filled with snakes on the side looking to just devour you. And it's not just the uh, sexual exploitation. There's all kinds of exploitation. And I remember being a young actor, having my hopes dashed and my balloon of hope deflated. And I really like it when I find somebody who's about to buy into the BS of one of those snakes and I tell them otherwise. There's a, there's a Bugs Bunny. I think it's the Bugs Bunny that introduces uh, the witch and it's Hansel and Gretel. And he's pretending to be a truant officer. You know, why aren't the children at school, madam? And he finds the two of them sitting in a pot getting ready to be cooked. And he says, run for your lives, children for she is a witch and means to eat you alive. And of course they both say, ah, and they go to leave and Hansel comes back and goes, ah, your mother rides a vacuum cleaner. I like being that guy who snatches the kids away from just before they step into the oven and let them the know. Jaws of yeah, he says he's a producer, but he's just, he's really just a grip. If you sleep with him, you're not going to get that role. You know, I love, I love being that person who helps entry actors, not necessarily young, helps them understand where they're being guided down the wrong path. Yeah, that's the way I should put it. Not the snake thing, not the Bugs Bunny thing. It's just step, stopping them from going down into the sewer just because Pennywise the clown is going, here's a red balloon. I love thwarting the evil intentions. I love that. Yeah, wow. What, what do you feel like 
uh, without without having to name names necessarily, are there any things in particular that stand out as frequent sort of misdirections that people are tempted by or, or wrong turns that you feel like are sort of consistent or repetitive? Sure, that sure. I know I know a film director in uh, in LA who I knew when he was a college kid and I helped him get his I got I helped him get his big break into the business. And unfortunately, he's become all of that. And when I'm on the phone with him, he'll say, I'm going to let you go, which is a great phrase in LA, because I didn't say I, I need to go. I didn't say, please let me go. I, I you know, no, no. That's, how I'm, that's how I'm going to end our conversation. Right, by the way. right. But it's not him saying, I have to go. Yeah. Uh, and it's not him asking, it's, it's him making it sound like it's a favor to me. I'm going to let you go, which is the essence of all the exploitation. Somebody, when you have the power, right? You're, you're a very talented leading man. You look great on camera. Camera loves you. You're going to get opportunities. But the person who gives you an opportunity makes it sound like they're giving you a favor in order to then get something of value in return from you, something you may not want to give. But the bottom line is nobody in this business takes a chance that might result in them losing their job if it goes wrong. So if somebody comes to you to put you, Trevor, into a movie, it's because they know you're a sure thing. They know you're going to make them look good, but they still have to make it sound like, you know, they're helping you out. Man, I'm, really, I'm really out on a limb for you here. Yeah, I'm really out of it. No, you're not. This is I'm your sure thing. But you want me to be somehow indebted into you uh, to you for somewhere down river. Um, that's that's where so many of those things come from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I like to think that the Me Too movement is finally letting those snakes know that they can't get away with it, like they have been for for generations. Um, you know, how many young starlets? You know eager, hopeful, get off the bus in LA and two years later, they're sobbing all their way back to Kansas. You know, sadder but wiser. Let's skip that step. Let's find a way we can do just good work. Mm -hmm. I had a mm -hmm. buddy of mine, this movie we were doing, I was an actor in it, I was associate producer, we had good people in it. And I'd seen this actress in a movie that was screened at Vidiots on Pico Boulevard. The guy who made the movie had used had been, an, had been a, a, a clerk at Vidiots. And Benicio Del Toro used to come in and go, hey, anytime you, want, you get a movie going, I'll be in it for you. And this was right after Usual Suspects. And Del Toro took this small role in this little film just to help this guy out because he said he would. That's cool. Yeah. And I, I really liked the actress who I'd never heard of in this movie. So as we were casting our movie, I said to the, my, my filmmaker and our producer and our head of casting, I said, I want to bring in so-and-so. And they said, let me, let me not use the actual word. Are you having relations with her? Which is not what they said. I said, no. They said, do you want to have relations with her? I said, no. Then why are you bringing her in? I said, because I think she'd be the best actor for the role. I think she'd be amazing in our film. And it just broke my heart that the people I was working with, that this wasn't, this wasn't the, the system. These were... This was indie film. Indie film was, this was Sunday. These, we're, we're these were like to... human beings. You're really having conversations with them. They're sort of a, a taking for granted for cynicism. Somebody, the only reason to bring in somebody is if they have a name that's going to help us. And if they don't have a name, then, then the only reason you bring them in is so that they'll have relations with you, if I can use the euphemism again. Yeah, wow. And it just, it broke my heart. So I really went at it. And she got the role. Mm. And no, I never saw her socially. And I, and I imagine it turned out beautiful. She gave a great performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I care, I care about film and the people who make film. And we shouldn't all be broken because we've been abused and exploited that way. And it's sort of like taken for granted for cynicism. Yeah, yeah. And it's, mm. not just, it's not all just fat old guys with cigars and hopeful young starlets. It works in every, every possible... Uh, angle there you know there are women taking advantage of young guys there are women taking advantage of women there are men taking care of men you know it's all that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> i had a buddy of mine who i don't know how he, he was at a party this was 
in the early and mid 80s when I first went out there and got my head handed to me. He was at a party and he met the casting directors of, no, the producers of The Love Boat. He said, I love the show. He said, and you always have these really beautiful people hanging around the pool on that pool set in the background of all that. And the producer said, would you like to be on it? He said, yeah, great. And they went, how much would you like to be on it? He went, oh, oh, no, 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 thanks. Okay, never mind. Yeah, oh, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, those are those are the exploiters, and and I'd love to foil their dastardly makes plot. makes the effing skin crawl. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, well, maybe this this will tie in nicely. What do you what do you feel like? Maybe in connection with that, what do you? Or or we could also just totally shift gears with this question. Whatever wherever this question takes you, what do you what do you find most challenging these days in your work as a whatever, as an actor, writer, script consultant, career coach, what do you feel like are, what is uniquely challenging at this, in this day and age? As an actor, it's doing the job. I have so much fun with the pursuit that there are times when after I book the job, I go, oh, oh, no, no, now I have to do the thing. You know, it's, I get, I get really, really engaged with finding the work getting the work doing my job and my wife my wife we we tape each other's auditions and she's really great she's a great director of my auditions and the camera person and all that and i really have like the most fun doing that and then when i get the call from my agent that i booked a job it's almost anticlimactic <laughs> and i have to i mean you know my story about working on the irishman with de niro and and uh scarcity yeah. But that's something, that's something I didn't have to, you know, perk up for. But there are other times I get something and I go, oh, right, right. I'm going to have to do this job now. You know? is, is it a matter of then, you know, nerves emerging as you realize, okay, I'm going to be on set or it's more just straight anticlimactic, like, like. Which is good to do the job. I mean, yeah. nerves are not your friend when, you know, I look that first time out in LA for me where I just was, which is a disaster. The straw that broke this camel's back for me was I had an audition for Silver Spoons. And I hadn't had, I wasn't getting auditions, you know. My first day in LA, I got a job. They were shoot, they were, ABC was bringing on a daytime version of Love American Style, the new Love American Style. And they, and I found out the casting director's name and where his office was. And it was on one of the ABC lots. And I drove up and I parked. And I walked up to the guard booth, figuring out how, this was 1986, how was I going to talk my way through the booth in order to get there? And the guard, he has a little TV at the booth and he's got all my children on. So he sees me, he gives me a big wave. And You're a big star. How you doing, on. Alfred? I said, hi. I didn't have to ask, I just kept walking. You know, yeah. I assumed I knew I belonged there. I, I, I'd be in places like this. And I, I walked, I found the casting. I just wandered the hallways, found the casting office, introduced myself to the cast director who was shocked. Told him I, who I was, the show I was working on. I just came out to LA and da, da, da. And, and he called. He called the casting office of All My Children in New York. And they went, oh, Bill's there? Great. Bill's, Bill's very funny. He'll be great for you. And he kept going, now, Bill, you have to be funny in this. I said, I don't know. Good. And I got hired and I was on one of the first episodes of the new Love American style. We rehearsed, it was, you know, we each had it. There was two sketches in the half hour. Yeah. One sketch rehearsed in the morning, the next sketch rehearsed in the afternoon. The next day, one sketch shot in the morning and the other sketch shot in the afternoon. And I was the morning one. And I was the lead of the four people in it. I was the lead. And I had a great time. But I'm telling you, when we shot, the other three actors, none of whom had nearly as much to do as me, had their scripts hidden everywhere behind the chairs, under the couches, they, all of them stressing about learning their lines and knowing their lines and all that. Like the lines just weren't sticking. They were just struggling oh, to mess hmm. This heart worked in LA. And after we taped, the four of us went out to a Mexican joint for lunch. And the three of them who were hardcore LA actors said, got to tell you, buddy, we were really, we were really kind of, you know, uptight. You know, we found out you were, you were just in from New York and you're a New York actor and you knew all your lines, right? You knew your lines in rehearsal. And I thought, well, if this is how this town works, 
I'm going through this town like Sherman through a goose. You know, I was, I, I, this was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. In a year and a half, that was the only job I booked. I lost the nerve I had that first day, just walking onto a lot. And I got the silver spoon audition. And it was like, it was like the old me from two or three years earlier. And, and we had a great audition. And this young woman who was the casting person loved what I did and said, okay, you're coming back to the, for the producers. It's 11 a.m. Now you're going to be back at 5 p.m. because it starts shooting tomorrow. And I spent the day in my head figuring out every debt I would pay off with the money from Silver Spoons. And by the time I got back to, do, to go to producers, I was so aware of the stakes that I, I don't know if I've ever had a worse audition. And I'm walking, into the, I'm walking through the parking lot, deciding if I'm going to get in my car or get under it. And she ran up to me. The cast director stopped everything with the producer in the room and ran out into the parking lot and said, I don't know who that just was. Would you please come back and let the producers meet the young man that I met this morning? And I went back, but of course I'd already done, you know, it was too late. I'd already, you know, shown them to the other side and I just, and I didn't get it. And I was, I came home shortly after that. Can't be oh, able to be Bill. <laughs> but oh. gift, remember the gift I have sharing that with you and everybody. Yeah. Who's with you, now, you know, hopefully you guys, I mean, that's a snake hanging off the side of the, of the bat cave. Hopefully you guys get that for me. Look, I mean, well, learning what, what, what is this the snake is the those thoughts creeping in your sense yeah, yeah really and, and just just taking advantage of your weakness you know all those bats coming out of the cave they're not thinking about maybe there's a snake hanging there they're just doing their thing i mean yeah it, it's a great way to learn the stove is hot by putting your hand on it but it's also even better to learn the stove is hot when you see somebody else put their hand on it so hopefully everybody out there now can yeah. observe your your burned hand. Scars yes. are there from silver spoons. Don't walk up behind me and go silver spoons. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. And so you so you came back from L.A. back east after that, yeah. And all, and I, I got lucky. I signed up with a temp agency, and uh, and they put me in the casting office of an ad agency. And the mm. casting director there was this amazing woman named Maxine Marx, who was the daughter of Chico Marx of the Marx Brothers. Mm. And Maxine and I became great pals. And, and she was a legend in, in the commercial business. Uh, and uh, we became great pals. And for many years, uh, she was a big part. Uh, I mean, she was, she was just retiring then. And she was like 70 at that time. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from her. I was very fortunate to call her my friend back then. Mm -hmm. That's Marks, amazing. Daughter of the yeah. Chico came home from Paramount one night, sit down to dinner, and there's mom and Maxel, their only their only child. She's giggling. She's 16. He says, What are you laughing about? She said, Well, and she says, Well, Maxie's talking about how handsome Cary Grant is. Oh, oh. The next night, dinner, door opens up, Chico walks in with Cary Grant. Right there. 16 <laughs> year old Maxine. Did he was he was charming, chatty. She never opened her mouth. She could not speak. She was so red faced and embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Different world, different world. Yeah, yeah, every yeah, just a, a different level of I don't know reality, e ease of access and ease of freewheeling yeah. social circles within the industry. I imagine and yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, an industry, it's an industry that we want to do well in. Those of us who are just starting out and are on the outside looking in. We've, we've watched movies. Now we want to make movies. We want to go from being a consumer to a creator. And I love helping with that transition. I guess that's the other answer to coaching. I think I'm helping with that transition. Helping people step into a place of sort of creative ownership of their own yeah. journey into the yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've been watching movies and now you want to make movies. And mm -hmm. this is what's required. I mean, I met, I've, I've done a lot on the film festival circuit and I've met a lot of people who just because they wanted to make a movie and had the money to make it doesn't mean they were ready to make it. You know, um, uh, the hallmark of the independent film circuit for me, the festival circuit is ignorance and arrogance. Just because you know how to drive cars really well, doesn't mean you could build a car that could compete 
with the product that's coming out of Detroit. And that's the same way when you go say, I'm going to make a movie. Okay. But at a certain point, you're going to want people to see the movie so you can pay off the debt you went into by making the movie. And that means you've got to be competitive with what else is out on the market. And a lot of people, when they put their movies together, they forget that. Specifically, what, what are those specific things that you feel like would end up missing? Just like well, top to uh, bottom, maybe a little bit uh, of everything uh, from, I've from- seen, I've seen people make on the independent film special circuit, they make a crime thriller. Okay, but, but you're asking us to sit through something that you're making what's basically a sort of a double A level version of an episode of Law and Order. Or, you know, look at what started the indie film festival movement. What, what created a need for Redford to create Sundance? You look, mm. at, you look at Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotapes. You which, look at, which films really pop in that world? Habits. You look at Jim Jarmusch's Stranger Than Paradise, which so many <laughs> people forget. Those three films, almost by themselves, create, they show Hollywood that there's a market for independent film is misnamed. It shouldn't be called independent. It should be called alternative. Make a product that's different than what Hollywood makes. Don't try to make what Hollywood makes. Make something that's so different, it stands out and it pierces the market. Mm -hmm. You should go back and watch Strange and Power, or Jarmusch's second film, Down by Law, which is a favorite of mine. So it's no one of my one of my dad's favorite films, actually. Yeah. Oh, God, down, Roberto Bernini and Down by Law is hilarious. Mm. But nobody at the studios was making that kind of thing. Nobody on TV was making that kind of thing. And if you want to make your own project in order to advance your career, like you know, like uh, Anderson and, uh, and the and the Wilsons with Bottle Rocket, make a product that is an alternative to what the studios are offering. Because Hollywood is Detroit. They're doing hamburgers over here. I'm doing right. If they're making hamburger, you know, you you make yourself a, a nice seaweed salad, and people go, "Oh, I've never had seaweed salad before." And maybe I don't want seaweed salad every day, but there's a there's a there's a spot and there's a place in time and a, and a yeah. niche for it. Yeah. Did you, did you ever see Bar Girls? You know, Bar Girls was was about the the lesbian single scene in Los Angeles. And nobody had made something like that. Uh, I'm sorry. It came out almost the same time as, as a very similar film called Go Fish. But before those two movies, if you wanted to see uh, a, a same-sex uh, love story between two women, you'd have to go back to John Sayles' Liana. And other than that, there was almost nothing. Hmm. You know, it, lesbianism was depicted uh, as aberrant the way homosexuality was depicted as, as aberrant in motion pictures. But now you had enough money and you had enough skill to come up with something that was an alternative. Both Bar Girls and Go, Go Fish did extremely well at the box offices. You know, like, like Brothers McMullen, like El Mariachi. Mm. Make something that, that can't, doesn't even try to compete with Hollywood. It's yeah. Something. It's just comfortable being in its own lane. Um, yeah. Last two questions I'll, I'll throw your way and then we can wrap up. I'm sure you've got... Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you go um, in a bit here. Um, what are some, what are some either challenges or opportunities that you feel like are unique to actors today that didn't necessarily apply to actors 10, 15, 20 years ago? Things that, and I, you know, and I know people, people talk about content creation that's kind of the rave of, of a lot of conversations pertaining to, you know, how actors can empower themselves. You know, and outside, and if there's things from that that you feel like are really pertinent to talk about, by all means. Um, but things aside from content, you know, the ability and the and the ease of access to creating one's own content. Yeah, outside I, of that, I, anything that I, well, I, well, to you? easily number one is is technology. Mm -hmm. You can with by yourself even you can make a whole film on your ghost stick. Yeah, and, uh, you can download. Uh, onto your laptop, you can edit yourself, you can put it out on YouTube or so many other uh, streaming services or, or, or providers. There's so, so many, many things that you can do uh, without the requirement of the amount of money this used to uh, need. Um, so I think that is definitely number one. Um, 
and and number two is an extension of of the market that there are so many markets out there. Um, what actors have to overcome is what ha- actors have always had to overcome: waiting for an opportunity, waiting to be told that they're good, waiting for someone to to validate. You know, when you live in L.A., I know actors who wouldn't go to auditions unless the casting office validated their parking because otherwise parking is so expensive. And people running around LA looking for validation is a pretty cool metaphor for what they're doing. I was going to say, it's a, it's a, yeah. If, if a wholly if, substantiated metaphor. You have to make your own criteria. You have to satisfy your criteria of what what's an effective performance, what's a good audition. And that's it. And then you move forward, continuing to find what helps you, what benefits you as a creative being, what helps you as as a craftsperson and what helps you is welcomed in and what doesn't help you is pushed out and it's very tricky to learn how to identify just like improv to identify immediately that helps that doesn't help i want to be closer to you i don't want you anywhere near me you know i love that scene brad pitt in moneyball when he sees jonah hill and that scene in cleveland and he just notices that everybody looks to him with a little yes or no and he seeks him out down in his, his cubicle and goes, who are you? Mm-hmm. He knows right away, right? I want, I want you to be close to me. You know, this is a healthy relationship. This is a, this is a relationship that can benefit me. And we've got to conduct business, which is the fair and equitable exchange of goods and services. I have something you want. You have something I want. You can, you can recite a Shakespeare monologue at my wedding. I can give you a hundred bucks for it. You know, that's, goods and services, equitable exchange. And you have to tune out the inequitables, the exploitation. Hey, I'll let you recite a Shakespeare model like at my wedding and I'll only charge you $200. Oh, may I? Mm. Mm-hmm. One, uh, well, well the, the question that comes up with regard to that in terms of sort of, you know, establishing your own criteria, which I love that idea. It's no, that I mean, I feel like that's the concept that's sort of been, vaguely dancing around in my mind but not really articulated that way okay like taking for example shooting your own self tapes at home you and your wife you sort of act as you know co-creators you sort of offer i guess i would assume kind of like coaching advice to each other and helping guide each other in whatever way you see fit um i'm not sure what the question is exactly um to what how how else does that collaborative process work in terms of like in the in the you know specific example of shooting self tapes? Is there is there a need for I don't know any 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 outside source of helpful criteria as opposed to y'all just sort of feeling like you've internalized enough of a sensibility about that sort of thing that you can really feel comfortable that what y'all come up with in the room is going to serve well when it goes out to casting? Yeah, well, and it's just track record, you know, but. Track record is not batting average. That's another tr- tough thing about us actors. We don't get a job. There's so many factors behind that decision that have nothing to do with the work we did at the audition. So many other factors. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to own it as a failure of ours. It's not a failure. It's not a failure. You should, you should be able to go one for a hundred and not lose faith and confidence in what you do because that's the nature of the business. I would say to everybody, if you can, even as an intern, work in casting, work somehow for a casting director or a producer, and you see what goes, what goes on with the decision to cast a certain actor over another actor. And then you would yourself become a better auditioner because you're not squeezing the bat so tight that you have to hit the home run. Mm. And because she and I have been together for 20 years, I completely trust her. She catches me when I'm being lazy and I'm phoning it in. No, we need another take. Got to do another take. You know, um, and how, I, how many how many takes would you say on average for like let's say a, a two page scene? How often? Absolutely, what? absolutely no answer to that. I have sent in first takes. I've done single take and went that's it, and I've sent it in and I've gotten the job. You know, I've worked on things for five. I I don't do a lot of takes. You know, five or six takes is is a lot for me. If something is going wrong, technically, a truck goes by or something, um, uh, with, mixes with the audio. But I'm going to go dry after about 
you know, a handful of it takes. Hmm. And again, I'm, I'm booking, I'm booking at the co-star level. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not, guest, I'm not guest stars. I'm not getting series regular, but at my age and I don't have, you know, name recognition, that's going to be tricky for me to get, but I have enough of my side work, the script adapting, my voice acting career, coaching that, uh, that I'm okay with doing co-stars you know, for now. Hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully one will lead to some, something else, but I'm not hanging my hat on it. You know, what I need to do is work. What I need to do is put myself out there, challenge myself. I need to find the work. I need to book the work. I need to do the work. And then mm-hmm. I need to move on. And if something enough, as you know, I've got hundreds of stories about how actors furthered their career off an opportunity, as well as actors who failed to capitalize on an opportunity and killed their careers. You know, there's all those stories are out there. All the questions you and I have about our acting careers, they've already been answered by the people who've come before us. So it's in our Mm -hmm. best interest to read up on them. Mm -hmm. Last question I got for you. Um, You talked with, uh, you talked with Peter Pamela Rose about the importance of collaboration, the importance of having, you know, collaborative partnerships. Um, not wanting to make this question about Brian Cranston at all, but him being, you know, this really sort of central creative relationship you've had. So whether whether it's about him or whether it's about, you know, another creative partnership you've had over the years, what would you say the most like formative lessons or things you can take away from having had the presence of those sorts of relationships over the years? Because it's like, I, I feel like I look at it both in terms of myself and a lot of, you know, my my friends who are actors, writers, directors, who the number of people who I feel like are work doing a lot of a lot of work in isolation, both, you know, their writing work, they're directing, they're, you know, they're acting, they're doing so much in isolation. Yeah. And just what you can say as far as, you know, really formative, important, valuable aspects of having these creative partnerships, collaborative wow. partnerships. Now, let me dovetail in something about that when you talk about isolation. When you achieve the career that you've been envisioning, as, as Brian certainly has, you have to deal with another level of isolation. You know, he, it, you know, w- when you're a household name, when lots and lots of people really admire your work and really get, really follow you, um, that, that then spill, spills into your social life, into your, into your personal life, into your, into your day. Um, and it's tempting for someone in that position to isolate themselves. Uh, and in Brian's case, forget about how we were as friends when we first met and, you know, we'd play wiffle ball in in Central Park after we both rapped, you know. Um, I try to be a friend to him because of that environment, because he gets disconnected he's working really hard you know he's he wants to say yes to everything he gets offered to him he's being offered everything uh but he sort of loses connection with the daily world um you know he used to fly home every friday night uh from albuquerque during the six years of breaking bad you know and it was it got pretty tough getting through the airport and and pretty tough you know and you've got all those those idiots with their cameras who are on whatever that darn show is, where they just park at the baggage claim at LA. TMZ or whatever. Yeah, TMZ. You know, you got that to deal with. Yeah. Uh, uh, I remember when we were doing uh, uh, All the Way up in Cambridge at American Rep uh, uh, at ART, and dozens and dozens and dozens of guys, every second he step out of the theater, they jump out of the bushes and they would have Breaking Bad stuff for him to sign so that they could then go to ebay and sell it so these weren't fans asking for an autograph it's not, it's not even yeah it's not even like genuinely yeah. touched it's by his work complete. it was just people trying to turn a dollar complete exploitation complete Ugh. exploitation. yeah yikes and you know and there's and there's cameras on them and if and if after this guy has asked him for the 400th time hey brian i want to make more money off you and i'm not and for free for you know at least at least offer him a cut or something you know um i have a latte but he's got cameras on him everywhere and and if he tells if he if he tells off a guy the way he wants to 
that suddenly that's on the news, you know? Yeah, how, how, how can you not at some point have little yeah. momentary slip ups? So it is a different kind of, I, I, of isolation there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question, but it was fun talking about that. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of another way to, to approach that question. But no, I mean, I think that's, that's, yeah, that's super helpful to think about. As far as your work, in what way do you feel like these relationships or, or different creative partnerships have sort of yeah, kept you glued in, focused, inspired? What, what kept me glued in, I'll tell you, what kept me glued in for beginning in 1991 when I found my way into ADR group looping was the opportunity to work with all the directors I admired. Uh, I, I looped two Sidney Lumet films with Mr. Lumet in the recording studio with us, mm -hmm. calling me by name, giving me direction. And that's, that meant the world to me. You know, the, the people who have directed me in voice work doing the, the post-production group looping, but still that's a SAG day player contract. And it, it, no, directors aren't there for TV, but, uh, but the directors are there for most film. And the people I was able to get, I mean, the first one I ever did, I was directed by Ron Howard. Hmm. You know, I've been directed by Frank Oz four times. Love, love, love Frank Oz. Working with Frank Oz because we would find jokes in the group looping. We would get additional laughs just in the group walla. Ang Lee directed me three times. You know, uh, that helped me more than anything else understand my ability and my power that I didn't understand in my 20s when I was working on the soap, which is why I didn't advance. Your and, value. And work, my value, great, so well put. And working with all of those really cool guys, Mary Harron, Boko Schlondorf, I, I, this really, really cool direct, Peter Hedges, I've worked with Peter twice. Um, really wonderful, Mel Gibson directed me, Al Pacino directed me, you know, actors mm -hmm. directing their films. My day with Al was like one of the great days of my life. It almost mm. as my on camera with De Niro and Scorsese and the Irishman. And, uh -huh. But all of those things prepared me for that day when I walked on the set uh, for the Irishman. Um, mm. So I would say more than anything else, those creative collaborations in that little room looping film with really top tier filmmakers. Um, that that was my that was my battery that 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 charged me. Well, just because now I feel like I have to ask this question after that little little um, what, what if you had to, if you had to sum it up in a in a few sentences what would you say how would you describe your value if you were if you were as far as the most your your your, your greatest let's say strength the thing primarily that you feel like you contribute the most value through i conduct my business on a professional level and in my craft in my art i give compelling and surprising performances mm -hmm. if i'm the guy delivering the mail or if I'm the U.S. senator telling my aide to shoot somebody in the head, I'm going to find a way to do. It. I'm going to find a way to do the scene in a way that the viewer has not seen before, because yeah. because the market craves innovation. The market doesn't want to see you, the actor, play a scene, even if the scene is a scene they've seen 400 times before. They don't want to see you play it the same way it's always played. Well, and it probably helps that you're as well versed as you are that you've seen all these other versions of similar scenes and you go, I know how- first thing, The first thing he does is identify how the scene is always done. And then, hmm. they, and then the next thing is, I'm gonna find a different way. And the best example is Biloxi Blues where he plays the Marine drill sergeant. He plays the, he plays the, the drill instructor. Lou Gossett Jr. won an Oscar for it, an officer and a gentleman the screaming, yelling drill, drill instructor, Arlie Ermey in Full Metal Jacket, Jack Webb in the DI, Darren McGavin in Tribes. You can go on and on and on, and you know exactly how that scene's played. The guy who played the role on Broadway, 
did it that same way. So when you see Biloxi Blues and all the recruits get into the the uh, the barracks, the little line, yeah, and they all waiting. Suddenly you see you hear a door open and close and footsteps, and everybody kind of stops and kind of waits. And suddenly it's Christopher Walken, and he goes. <laughs> All in. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what you'd expect yeah. and it's brilliant mm -hmm. i think all actors should embrace that example yeah because i think, I think be, yourself, be yourself you go what you mean you want me to do it like sean connery or george lazenby or, or, or daniel craig or idris elba no, i want you to do it like you you show me how you want to do it mm -hmm. they mean that they mean that I think Brand, Brando said something similar. Like every time he reads a scene, he's like, okay, how, what's the cliched version of this? Yeah, that's exactly What's the cliche? cliche? Yeah. And Brando um, also has that great line I really like. Just because they say action doesn't mean you have to do anything. You know, God, I remember, I think the first, one of the first times I came to you, I came in and I don't know what, I, I don't know where my head was at exactly. I came in and I wanted some coaching from you and I came in with about like, like fucking like 12 monologues or something. And I just sort of like rattled them all off and it was, you know, sort of, and I remember, I remember that coming out of your mouth. That was one of the first things you said. You, it was something like, you know, when you think about doing monologues, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, just because you're about to, you have to start this thing doesn't mean you have to really do anything. Just, uh, just, just be with it. We had, a um, once, we had a conversation once you were writing something and I suggested you watch the Arthur Penn film Night Moves with Gene Hackman. Do you remember me saying that or did you ever seek it out? I, do, I you probably did. I don't remember that. Yeah, we were no. talking about the we talked about the the detective genre, and so of course it was Maltese Falcon and Big Sleep and Murder My Sweet and Marlowe and all those things. Um, and I watched Night Moves again two nights ago with my wife, uh, and I hadn't seen it this century. Yeah, and as it's it's some of Hackman's finest work in one of the most neglected movies. You never heard mm. of it about Night Moves. Because um, I told you about the ending. The ending is something you never see coming. And once it comes, it makes perfect sense. That's the reason why I brought it up to you is in writing, you want, yeah, you do want stuff coming out of left field, but oh, only, that, if, only if afterwards they make sense. Night Moves, uh, uh, is that the, I think that's the film Goldman talks about that in, in Adventures in the Screen Trade, I believe. You know, we, it's been a long time since I read that book, but yeah, you're probably right. because I think that's, that's the story he tells us about Night Moves. Um, I'll, let, me, let me throw the same question I just threw at you, and I'll, and I'll throw it to you now as more in, in the realm of coaching and consulting, what you feel yeah. like your principal value as a coach and consultant, you know, compared to let's say other coaches who whatever you, it seems like other coaches may or may not be bringing to the table right. where you feel like your biggest value is honesty honesty completely honesty um i'm not trying to get a client hooked on me so i can make more money off them which i think a lot of acting teachers do i don't i can't speak for coaches but uh but a lot of acting teachers i remember i i felt guilty for not having formal training when I was on a soap. So someone talked me into taking a, an acting class in New York City. And you know, I'm, I'm a kid from the suburbs of Jersey. And this first day of the class, people stood up and they kept saying, I've been studying here for about six years. And I think I'm finally getting ready to audition. And I just thought, oh boy. this is a scam. This is, uh, this is Chico and Groucho in Day at the Races, get your Tootsie Footsie ice cream. Which by the way, if you don't know that reference, I think life, the secret of life, is the Tootsie Footsie ice cream scene in Day at the Races. So it's on YouTube, but that's the secret. When Groucho tries to bet on a horse named Sunup and Chico tries to sell him another horse. That's the secret of life right there. More than anything else I've ever seen is that comedy scene, the Tootsie Footsie ice cream scene from Day at the Races. Uh, I, I help people understand what the business is. Like you, you could have mentioned the Goldman, you know, what's the, what's the big line in the Goldman? Nobody knows anything. You know, uh, I, I help people get past there. Please tell me I'm good. Or always oh, there, you know, everybody says I shouldn't bother. And my attitude is, why not you? This is an inexhaustible market. And the machine is a beast. And you got to feed the beast. Everybody makes a lot of money on telling stories on television and film and stage. 
but they need someone to say the words. They need someone to fire the gun. They need someone to, to fly through the air with a pretty girl. Why, Why not, not you? Why not you? They're, the woods are full. Hollywood annals are full of, of actors who didn't start very good. Try to sit through Jack Nicholson's first couple of films. He was in the business a good 10 years before he figured it out. And he figured it out in the Philippines on a, on a film he was doing there. And everything, he said, everything I did before then, I can tell I'm just, I'm just a young man desperate to make it in movies. All of my performances all came from, I'm just desperate to make it in movies. So if I can put things in context, yeah, that's another big thing for me. I do put things in context to help give actors a better chance to hone their craft and navigate the business. The end. Beautiful. Well, we can end on that and I'll let you go. So cool. Great seeing you, man. Dude, you too. I appreciate your time. Really, this is this is great. Let's do this again sometime. We we might have to do that. Yeah, yeah. Watch night moves. Watch night moves. Watch night moves. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. Talk to you about Good. it when I time. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll write you a little, I'll write you my uh, I'll give you my thoughts. Good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool, okay. dude. Really good seeing you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Be well.